Well, I'll start by saying this is going to be a space policy talk, not an X-Corps talk. So my marketing guy is already bleeding. The ear is just hearing me say that. But I try not to mix the two, the two topics because there really are two different roles that I have. Um, I don't do an awful lot of space policy talks, but it just so happened I did my first one in 2009, just before the Augustine Committee hit. I did my next one a year later at ISDC, and I guess it takes me about a year to work up a good head of steam to say something about space policy, so here I am at ISDC again. And um, for, unusually for me, I am going to use a few slides, but I'll try to use as few as humanly possible, but I figured I am in a, in a NASA town. And if I don't have some slides, nobody will be able to hear what I say. <laughs> I want to talk about strategy for NASA, and a, in particular, a strategy for NASA for settlement. Because I think strategy is the void that we have right now. We have lots of people who want to talk about tactics. Which rocket should we fly? Where should we go? What order should be in? Which contractor should get the job? Um, and we have just started, I think, to realize over the last eight or 10 years that we do have a goal for the National Space Program. And I want to talk about that a little bit. But between having a goal and having tactics, you have to have a strategy. And we don't. We don't even have the beginnings of, an, of a national agreement on what our strategy ought to be. And until we have one, we're going to continue to flail, which is more or less what's going on right now. So I went in, for, for, for a long time after Augustine ended, I was reluctant to go out and talk too much about what I thought the strategy ought to be. And when I would give talks about Augustine's findings, I would confine myself to the very highest level goal elements of it. And the reason for that silence was that, of course, I had ideas on the subject, but I didn't want to get in front of the national policymakers. You know, I don't, I'm just a, a guy looking in from the outside. And trying to figure out how to make some sense out of national policy is a hard job. And we pay people as taxpayers who have this job full time. You know, they work at NASA and they're staffers for key Congress people and they work in the White House. And it's their job to develop a national space policy. I didn't want, the minute they came up with one, I didn't want 10 calls from reporters saying, how come they're not doing what you said they ought to do? But I went into a senior person at NASA that I have a great deal of respect for recently, and I told him that. And he told me he thought that was a mistake, that, that the national conversation on what our stra space strategy ought to be wasn't happening, and that it's high time that we start having that conversation. So having said all that, I got to say, there are multiple right answers to this problem. One of the problems we have in the space advocacy world is that there's a small number of people who are very passionate about the details of space policy. And they're so passionate about it that any, if you're not in 100% agreement with them, they think you're 100% wrong. I am not one of those people. Okay, there are multiple right answers. Um, that has not prevented us, however, from as a nation pursuing one of the multiple wrong answers. Uh, so when I say things like we should do this, that's an example. That's not a prescription. You don't have to do it exactly that way, but maybe we can shoot over in that direction and less over in this direction. What is a strategy? Well, I'm, I'm an amateur student of World War II history, so I'm going to use that as an example. You start with a goal. What's the goal? Unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. That was the goal. Now, it wasn't trivial. That wasn't obvious. It took actually a bit of time at the beginning of World War II to figure out that that was the goal of national policy. You know, maybe we should have negotiated something. Maybe we should have made peace with one and gone to war with the other. But eventually the answer was, no, that's our goal. Unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. Strategies are the big picture approach that you take to get that goal. In World War II, our strategy was first, Europe first. We're going to deal with the problem in Europe and we're going to do a holding action in the Pacific. In Europe, what are we going to do? We're going to surround Germany and cut off the supplies that keep their war machine going and build up strength till we can invade. What are we going to do in, in the Pacific? We're going to island hop. We're going to establish naval superiority. We're not going to face the enemy where he's strong because most of our forces are over in Europe. We're going, to, we're going to take islands where he is weak, cut off his strong points, deny him supplies and starve him out, and then move on to the next island, what we came called the island hopping strategy. That's an example of what a strategy is. 
Objectives are measurable steps. They're what are you going to do that you can tell if he did it or not. We are going to invade France at Normandy Beach and we're going to hold it. That's an objective. Tactics are things like, do we need tanks, do we need airplanes, are we going to attack, are we going to do daytime bombing, are we going to do nighttime bombing? And the details that people fight about in space policy, like which factory in which state is going to build that bomber, doesn't even appear at the level of tactics. It's too small to worry about. The space race, can you go through the same thing? What's our strategy? Why do we have a space race? What are we trying to do? We're going to demonstrate to the world that the American system of government is superior to the Russian system of government. We're going to show them that our space capabilities are better than their space capabilities. We're going to quote from the Right Stuff movie, our Germans are better than their Germans. <laughs> strategy, what's the strategy in the space race? OK, we've got to pick some objective that we think, even though the Russians might be ahead of us today, there's, that we can beat them too clearly. Something so far out that, that we can beat them there in spite of them having a lead, and we're going to make that what the space race is about. What's the objective? Put a man on the moon before 1970 and return him safely to the Earth. You know if you did it. It's measurable. Tactics. We're going to have lunar orbit rendezvous, Saturn V program to build the ship to get us there, and we're going to need something in between that became the Gemini program to teach us how to do all the things we need to do to make Apollo work. All right. Now, it may seem, it certainly has seemed to me from time to time, like in the current national space policy, really in all of national space policy since the end of the space race, since the end of the Cold War, we haven't had a goal, let alone a strategy, tactics, objectives. But it's, become, it's became clear to me in the time I had on the Augustine Committee that we do have a goal. And there is a national consensus among policymakers that we have that goal. But everybody's kind of afraid to say it because they're not sure we can do it. So committee after committee after committee kind of edges up to the, the thing, and they kind of belly up to the bar and peek over a little bit and say, well, it's kind of like we should be doing settlement. Okay. Whoa. This black suit in front of the black background in the black room at midnight here. Um, who, who can no longer see my notes, by the way. Um, yeah, if you could turn those back on, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Don't worry, the slides will be available afterwards, okay? They're just illustrative. Um, but the only reason I even put up the slide is I don't want to read every quote, but I want to provide some documentary evidence to back up my assertion that committee after committee, you know, for some time now, the national objectives of the United States in space have been identified in things like national space policy documents findings of presidential commissions, you know, statements by presidential national science advisors, statements by presidents, statements by NASA administrators, you know, that all use different words, and none of them are quite willing to use the S word. Uh, but they all come right up to it, and if you, if you know the code, they're all saying the same thing. When, when Marburger says in the Bush administration that the vision for space exploration is about putting the solar system within the economic sphere of humanity, and President Obama gets up a few years later and says that our goal is the capacity for people to work and learn and operate and live safely beyond the Earth for extended periods of time in ways that are indefinite. We're talking about settlement. It is actually the national policy of the United States that we should settle space. Okay? I'm going to put one last quote in because it's commonly misattributed to me. I don't know why. The reporters right after the hearing where this was said all said it came from Grayson. I wish I had said it. I uh, wish I'd had the guts to say it, but it was actually Chris Chiba, one of my co-members on the committee, who said, humanity should become a spacefaring civilization, and it has, if that is not the point of human spaceflight, what the hell are we doing? Okay. Now here's the bad news, which is why nobody quite wants to talk about it. Okay, so fine, the goal is human settlement of space. But what would you have done in World War II if your honest assessment had been, we can't win? Would you have still set the national policy objective as unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan? There's an uncomfortable feeling out there that that is the only worthwhile goal of a national human spaceflight activity, 
but we don't think we can do it. So maybe we shouldn't talk about it too much. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think we can do it. I think we should do it. I think we better do it. Now, what does it mean to take settlement seriously as a national goal? Okay. Well, but first, let's face an uncomfortable truth. The national NASA budget is not going up. The fight is going to be how fast does it go down. A year ago, I was still sufficiently timid, even though I saw the writing on the wall, to say it's going to be a struggle to keep it level. Okay, now I'm going to go farther than that. We're not going to succeed in that struggle. The NASA budget is going to decline. Um, I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a desirable thing. I mean, I don't think earthquakes in California are a good thing, but we got them anyway. Uh, because U.S. federal non-defense discretionary spending is going to go down. And, our, and the entire fight in Washington is going to be, probably for the next generation, how fast does it come down, how smoothly does it come down, and, and are we, do we get elements of it down so that we still have time to deal with the problems, or do we wait till it's a catastrophe? That's the, that's the sum total of the policy debate that there's room for right now. Now, maybe in this administration or that administration, sometime in the next 20 years, that will be reversed for a year or two. You know, on the fields, the Pelinori may triumph for a day, but against the enemy now risen in the east, there is no victory. Uh, the, the budget's going down. Deal with it. So if we're having settlement of space, the population of human beings off the earth is presumably going up. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to call it settlement, right? So if the population's going up and the budget's going down, the central inescapable truth is that the amount of NASA dollars that have to get spent to support one human being off the surface of this planet has to go down every year, year in, year out. Otherwise, we can't have a growing population with a fixed NASA budget. And that means we can't win. We can't, we can't achieve our national goal. And that conclusion hasn't fully penetrated the people inside and outside of NASA who think about national policy. They still, they're still fighting the last war. They still think that it's about fighting for the budget to go up. Uh-uh. Those of us in the commercial world who are struggling to figure out a way to do things at a lower cost, and those of you in the government world who are trying to figure out how to achieve our national objectives on a fixed budget should be each other's best friend. Because you can't succeed in achieving national policy objectives without the success of the commercial industry. And your market, the market that, you know, to, uh, to the commercial industry, demand from any source is a market. That NASA demand can be a very important part of the market. You ought to be our best friend. We ought to think you're our best friend. But it's that vacuum that there's been a lack of a national strategy for how we implement those goals, how we achieve them, Onto that blank canvas, everyone projects their worst fears. That's human nature. Everybody thinks that if I don't know what's coming tomorrow and you want to change what I'm doing today, it's going to be bad. Um, and I have to place the blame for that void with the, with the executive branch. That's their job. That's the reason we pay them as taxpayers. It would be nice if Congress provided policy direction and leadership, but there's no sign of that. And I can't blame them for that because, in some sense, that's not their job. It's the executive branch's job. Now, those of you who watch television, there is a popular meme for how people react to the total absence of a strategy. This is a clip from a South Park episode called The Underpants Gnomes. <laughs> Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, <laughs> phase three, profit. This doesn't work. <laughs> this is the exploration paradigm, as I call it, or the Apollo paradigm. It worked great for the Cold War because we had different objectives. Today, our goal is settlement. Phase one, we're going to put boots on, pick your target. We're going to return to the moon. We're going to go balls out and put people on Mars. We're going to send human beings to a near-Earth object. And then, <laughs> and then there's going to be settlement. <laughs> there are some other people out there 
One of them used to be NASA administrator. Some of them are very active out there in the space advocacy community. They have what I call the base paradigm. We're not just going to put human being boots on another planet. We're going to build a base like ISS. We're going to build a base in, this, in low Earth orbit. That didn't work. We're going to build a base on the moon. And then, <laughs> and then there'll be settlement. It doesn't work. All of these strategies involve going into a system that has a very high cost per human being living on the other planetary body. And there is no strategy for how it's ever going to come down. So all that you're going to get, if we ever successfully executed one of those, which I have grave doubts about, but if we managed, we would be sorry. Because now what we, ha what we would have ISS on the moon, or ISS on Mars, or ISS on a NEO, or we'd have visited six more NEOs and planted six more flags. And then what the heck are we going to do? We still have no strategy. We still have no plan. Our national objectives are not met. So in the absence of this, all organizations, large and small, public and private, have Prime Directive 1, preserve the organization. Okay, it's not a unique feature of NASA. It's, it's true for all large organizations. So if you don't give them the direction, any kind of clear direction, what they do is they structure themselves to keep doing more or less tomorrow what they're doing today. So that leads to what I will very charitably call the industrial base paradigm. Phase one. Well, we have a fill in the blank. We have a rocket company, we have a spaceship company, we have a NASA center in our district. So NASA should fill in the blank, build our kind of rocket, buy our kind of spaceship, give work to our NASA center. And then we'll be around to figure out what we should do tomorrow. And that is essentially current national policy by default. These don't work. Um, I took you know, all of an hour and made up numbers to make these ever popular NASA sand charts. Um, <laughs> you know, no, th don't go parsing where'd I get these numbers from. I, 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 in, the, in the best tradition of the NASA administration under the previous administrator, I just made them up. <laughs> okay. But they are, they are qualitatively indicative of the problem. If we go down the strategy we're going today, which is the graph on the left, um, all of NASA's budget becomes consumed by ISS and by keeping the operating costs of some kind of Senate launch system alive. Those two alone eat the entire NASA human spaceflight budget. Um, you, you, can, you can now have a booster and a capsule, but nothing to do when you get wherever, nor can you have a lander to land on a planetary surface if you should manage to get there. It's barely conceivable that if we go down this strategy, we might eventually manage to visit some low gravity targets that aren't too far away, like near Earth objects. I am underwhelmed. Uh, if you envision adding money, it doesn't take a ridiculous amount of added money. You know, depends on how creative you want to get with the acquisition strategy. You know, a couple, mil couple billion a year. Uh, three was the number on Augustine, but I think with creative thinking, it might be two. Um, then you can consider doing something more aggressive and more ambitious, but it only pushes the problem off. Okay, if you, if we, even if the extra $3 billion a year appears and now you can afford to do a lander, then as soon as you want to start to build some kind of facility on the lunar surface, you're right back where you started, the budget crashes, you can't afford to build the new thing without canceling the old thing, and now we are in gap three where we're sitting here going, okay, so we're gonna have to cancel ISS and not replace it so we can afford to build ISS on the moon. And then that will take longer than you think and the public will lose interest. And besides which, we ain't gonna get the extra three billion a year anyway, so there's no point. It just isn't gonna work. So, as I said, in the absence of strategy, what we get is preserve the industrial base because Congress has people sitting on the relevant committees, and they're on those committees because they have NASA centers or large NASA contractors in their districts. Otherwise, why would they be on the committee? Nobody gets on the committee because they think space is great. They get on the committee, you know, which committee you get on in Congress is a question of how you best serve your constituents. This is just the way the system works. I bear them no ill will for this. Uh, what that means is most of Congress either couldn't care less about space, but a surprising number of them do. But they 
care about space in a sort of a space is neat way. Space is neat, NASA is neat, does good things, we should support it. So that means when policy debates like the one that we're engaging now come along, what happens is people like you go into Congress people's office and say, do this good thing. And then you leave and they turn to their staffer and they say, what's all that about? And their staffer says, I don't know, but we'll find out. And they, they find out as they go down to the staffer or the people who work on the subcommittee that worries about space issues. And they tell them what's good for their current constituents because that's their job. So in the absence of a strategy, again, that's why we have to fall by reflexively back to the status quo. And that's why we will until there is a strategy articulated. So I'm gonna spit one out. Uh, and I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying this is a way to do it. Think of it purely as an existence proof that it is possible for us to have one going forward. So again, the key to putting one together is to realize what has to be the central feature. The cost per human being living off the planet has to go down. It has to go down not just once, but on a fairly continuous basis. Doesn't mean the cost total has to come down. It means the cost to the taxpayer per human being has to come down. It doesn't matter how much private sector money they suck up because it comes out of a different pot. In order to pull that off, each new line item of thing we develop, and there's a lot of things that have to be developed, has to be designed so that it gets off of NASA's budget. So NASA comes in, they develop something or they pay for something to be developed, and then, important part, they have to get out. And, you can't, and the, the history of NASA shows Designing a government system by and for government purposes to be operated by government people and then we'll hope we can find somebody who wants to pick it up as a private capability isn't going to work either. If it's going to transition to private sector operation on a for-profit basis and find other customers, it has to be designed from the beginning to do those things. Which means NASA has to change the way that it develops systems. It has to become one of many customers for each critical step of the system. And it's not just LEO. And it's not just commercial crew. You know, after commercial crew comes along, we're going to need reusable Earth departure stages. We're going to need reusable planetary landers. We're going to need habitats in space. We're going to need habitats on planetary surfaces. We're going to need a lot of stuff. Every single one of those pieces has to be designed in such a way that it shares its costs and its customer base with the private sector from the beginning so that as soon as when NASA has established human presence on somebody, it can move on to the next one, but it leaves behind it a, all the suite of capabilities that's necessary to maintain human beings on that planetary surface with a cost structure and an operations cost, that's the critical piece, the annual operations cost, so low that it's credible that other private customers for these things will exist. It also has to develop some key technologies. There's, I've, to, I've spoken about that in other meetings. It's detailed in the Augustine report. There are technologies we need that we don't have sufficiently mature yet. The private sector is unlikely to pay for them. That's a critical role of government. It's not like NASA doesn't have things to do. The people who claim that if we shift to a, a exploration regime and a settlement regime in which NASA's role changes the people who take that and claim that means NASA's role ends are lying. They may be lying because they don't know any better, but in many cases I'm convinced that's not true. Each step forward also has to make a maximum use of in situ resources. You don't colonize or settle a place and then ship everything from the home country. Never worked before, no special reason to expect it's going to work this time. What's crystallized my thinking over the last two years about this is that, is that while we don't know with a capital N everything we'd like to know, we can now make a pretty reasonable guess that we can get propellant at a bunch of critical places that are interesting. We can get it on the moon. I mean, we're about, we know that about as well as we're going to without manned people walking around on the surface. Um, we can get it on Mars, and it looks increasingly likely we can get it on Phobos or Deimos. This begins to suggest what the strategy ought to be, and I call it planet hopping, by direct analogy to the island hopping strategy of the Pacific in World War II. 
what we got to do is take the planetary destinations in sequence. In each one of them, the purpose of the initial human outpost is not to be there and look cool. It is not to unfurl flags and take pretty pictures. And it is not for the holy grail of science. Although we will get all of those things. It's to make gas. Okay, you are miners. You dig stuff up and you're more, more likely you repair and operate the robots that dig stuff up and turn it into propellant that you can sell to back to NASA to fill up the gas stations that they need so they can move on to the next more interesting place. Again, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying this is a way to do it. If you do that, a lot of really interesting things fall out. One of the interesting things that falls out is that if propellant is treated as a commodity right from the beginning, then you treat it that way in Earth orbit. Instantly, something very interesting happens. If you do an exploration missions on sort of Apollo scale, or Apollo plus a little bit, you develop a market for 250 metric tons a year of propellant in low Earth orbit, which would roughly triple the current American demand for launch. That would have salutary effects on the price of launch immediately, simply because of increasing the volume of production of existing expendable launch vehicles that are currently operating way under capacity. And it would have even more profound effects on the cost of launch in the longer term, because right now the factor that's holding back companies like mine from developing a fully orbital, fully reusable launch vehicle is not technical. It's because it's very difficult to close the business case that says you should do it because the demand for launch is small and uncertain. If NASA starts buying 250 tons a year of propellant in orbit every year, the market becomes large and predictable. I mean, bankers love large and predictable. It also has the advantage that each new destination we reach and put a permanent presence on lowers the cost by a further multiplier to get to the next destination. So if we cut the cost of launch by a factor of two or three, which is quite credible, by having propellant storage and transfer on Earth orbit, then when the moon comes along and starts exporting propellant up to some place like L1, all of a sudden the cost of going to a NEO or to Mars has dropped by another factor of about three. And if you start putting propellant on Phobos and you make your, your first Mars expeditions go to Phobos or Deimos instead of going to the Martian surface, you can cut the cost of going to Mars surface by a factor of another about three. This is starting to really add up. Uh, you know, I won't bore you with the technical details, but it turns out if you refuel your vehicles on the moon and in L1, and you refuel your vehicles on the Martian surface and on Phobos, you don't need any expendable bits anymore. Everything can be reused. That has further salutary effects on the cost of launch. It's actually easier, crazily enough, to figure out how to design a reusable ship that goes from Mars to Phobos and Mars than it is to design a reusable ship that goes from Earth, or Earth to Earth orbit and back. Because it's single stage. You don't have to stage anything. You don't have to invent new technology. And this, this dreaded Mars entry, descent, and landing problem that we keep hearing about turns out to be solved if you're able to have enough propellant that you can do propulsive braking from terminal velocity in the Martian atmosphere, which you can do if you picked up your gas on orbit and you didn't have to bring it all the way from Earth. Along the way, we're going to have a couple of pieces like Gemini that we're going to have to demonstrate just because we got to learn how to do them. I mean, it's not all just going to be destination to destination. In particular, there's a couple of nasty problems we haven't solved yet. Um, uh, clearly, number one on those is cosmic radiation. Uh, we don't know enough about galactic cosmic ray hazards. And it's not just on the trip there. It also applies to planet design of planetary surface habitats and things like that. We have so much uncertainty about it, we aren't even sure it's a problem. We just think it's a problem. But we think it could be a really serious problem. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to study on Earth. So we're going to need to put some kind of laboratory facility somewhere outside of Earth's magnetosphere. L1 suggests itself. We've got a gas station that has to go there. Why don't we, whatever company we're going to buy lots of habitat volume from, I'm sure you can all think of at least one, uh, you know, we can park a module there. 
and astronauts can visit it when they're on their way to and from the lunar habitat and they can stop and drop off one set of lab rats and pick up the next one. Uh, and we can learn all the things we need to learn about galactic cosmic ray exposure before we have to send astronauts on a three-year voyage or a two-year voyage. We're also going to need, uh, we're not going to go to Phobos, I think. I mean, I know that my colleague, Mr. Zubrin, may disagree. But I do not think that we're going to do missions that are, you know, less than a light minute from Earth over and over and over again. And then the next thing we do is going to be a two-year mission. I just don't think it's going to happen that way. I think we're going to do some missions of intermediate length. Well, visiting Phobos is very much like visiting a near-Earth object. It's just farther away. So you got all the same ships, you got all the same capabilities, except it's energetically easier, we can do it earlier, and it's where no man has gone before. I think we should probably knock that off. Um, so I'm all in favor of a manned expedition to a near-Earth object as a tactic, as part of a larger strategy in service of a larger goal not as an end in itself, not as a stunt. The purpose of, of Gemini astronauts living for 14 days in a phone booth was not to replicate in space what we do with clowns and VWs, okay? <laughs> the purpose was it was a capability we had to prove that we knew how to make human beings stay alive in a spacecraft that long because that was how long it takes to go to the moon and back. The purpose of going to a NEO is to figure out how to go to Mars and back. If we do it with planning, with forethought as part of, of strategy, it makes perfect sense. As a standalone stunt, as a, as, a replica, as, a, as a poor man's Apollo, showing that we can go plant flags and footprints, somebody still, as long as there's no gravity there, uh, what's the point? And our national policymakers haven't articulated a point. They haven't explained a point. I'm not sure they know there is a point. Uh, so I can't blame the public for not getting the point. Nobody's telling them. I am not um, any less enthusiastic about the long-term potential of Mars than anybody else. I yield to none in my enthusiasm for getting to Mars. Um, you know, I, I, I thought Augustine, which I will quote from the Augustine report, you know, a human landing followed by an extended human presence on Mars stands prominently above all other opportunities for exploration. Mars is unquestionably the most scientifically interesting destination in the inner solar system with a planetary history much like Earth's. It possesses resources that can be used for life support and propellants. If humans are ever to live for long periods on another planetary surface, it is likely to be on Mars. And the only caveat I would add to that today is that I think that's probably still true because I think on Luna we're going to live under the planetary surface. Uh, you know, since this report was written, we've learned enough more about the moon to know that the moon probably can support a mighty civilization of its own. Um, but the radiation environment there is going to be a real problem, so, you know, expect to be moles. So I do believe that Mars should continue to be, as the President said in his address, our primary target for human exploration. I just don't think it's our first target for human settlement, because the reason why we're going to do the earlier settlements is to establish the beachheads that are going to make getting to Mars in an economically rational way affordable. I do want to say a few more words about cosmic radiation. Uh, it, is, it is misrepresented, in my opinion, many ways. It is not a trivial concern. There, there, are, there are those who would suggest, you know, we are men in those days and we will just face the radiation bravely. Um, you know, and, and, and for exploration purposes, that may be true, but, you know, for settlement, it's not enough to get to the other planet and get home and make it all the way home before you die of cancer. You, you have to be able to have kids after you get there. Um, that's not trivial. Uh, we aren't sure how to do it yet. Uh, so the people who basically say, damn the torpedoes, don't worry about it, are wrong. Um, but it's also absolutely not a barrier to the human settlement of the inner solar system. We know we can solve this problem. We have multiple ways of solving the problem. We just don't know which one is the one that's best and most effective yet. And, the, and they require different mission architectures. You can't just plug them in. It's not a kind of technology that you bolt on. You, you design your whole mission 
around what your strategy is for dealing with cosmic radiation. So it's kind of silly to design the mission before you figure out what, how you're going to deal with cosmic radiation. Unfortunately, that makes it sort of silly factorial to design and require and build the launcher before we figure out the mission architecture, before we figure out the destination, before we figure out the strategy, just after we've figured out the goal. Um, but just to list a couple of them, I mean, it may be that the risk is low enough that we can just live with it when you add certain bioprotective measures that researchers need to develop, and there are serious ideas for how to do that. But you've got to have a facility outside the magnetosphere to study it because we can't simulate those effects here on Earth. Uh, it might be that it's a sufficiently serious problem that we have to do something about it, and we can do something about it by making fast dashes from planet to planet uh, with an electric propulsion system of one kind or another. Um, and it's a myth that you have to have nuclear propulsion for that. I can show you in principle how to do it with thin film solar arrays. So we can do fast dashes from place to place, but there's a lot of work to do to get there. Or it may be sufficiently serious that even fast dashes won't deal with it, but fortunately Buzz Aldrin solved that problem too. And you do that by putting cycler halves up and you shield the heck out of them and then you take the, the cruise line to Mars instead of taking your sprint. Uh, they're all different choices, they all have different architectures, they all work much better if you can pick up propellant and shielding mass in cislunar space more cheaply than lifting it from Earth. So we don't have to worry about changing our strategy depending on which of these solutions we need, but we are going to need to change our tactics depending on which one of these solutions we need, which is why we're not ready to do that yet. So to be fair, I did a, a South Park chart. Um, for my idea of what a strategy would look like that's not a joke. Uh, the goal is a permanent and expanding population beyond the Earth. The strategy is for each location, develop the resources and use them to reach the next location. Government purchases should add to commercial markets to stimulate supply. And we have to identify the technology gaps and fill them. And then a possible set of objectives, I won't even descend to the level of tactics, would be we build LEO and L1 facilities to do propellant storage, so any kind of launch vehicle can, de can deliver that propellant. We set up a lunar base, human-tended, so that they can keep the teleoperated robots running for propellant production and export to, Lo to L1 and then to LEO. We replicate that same trick on Phobos, we set up an outpost on Phobos, and man, I got to tell you, that would be the science mission of a generation if we had people in Mars orbit that could teleoperate rovers in real time on the surface of Mars and pull samples back from every one of those many locations and collect the samples and bring them home. You know, Apollo would become a footnote before we even put the first boots on the surface of Mars. But that's not all they do. They're not just there for science. They're not just there to explore. They're there to make gas. They set up the propellant production. It may take a couple of missions. We have to study the geology of Phobos. And then we set the first footprints on the surface of Mars. After those teleoperated crews have already figured out how to set up the habitats, they've already set up and demonstrated propellant production, you know, the, 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 Hilton, the, whole, the Hilton Mars is waiting for you when you get down. Uh, and that makes that mission a heck of a lot cheaper. I won't bore you with the numbers, and anybody can quibble with the numbers. But I will say it's my belief that if we pursued this the right way, we actually could afford to do this all the way out to the first landings on Mars for the kind of budget NASA's getting now. It might even be able to go down a little bit. It'd be better if it didn't. I'm not in favor of decreasing NASA's budget. I'd like to increase NASA's budget. But at this time, our best shot of getting NASA to do something like this is to go to national policymakers and tell them, look, if you don't cut NASA's budget, we can at least stop growing it and still get a great human space program. In the words of Norm Augustine, a space program worthy of a great nation. And I think we should get one. So before I close, let's just think for a moment about what the alternative is, not just to this strategy, but to having a strategy. Well, the alternative is we'll probably keep doing more or less what we're doing now, which is we're going to build a big rocket, and then we're going to hope a space program shows up to fly on it. Uh, and in my opinion, that, stra that strategy, the strategy of default, 
is going to result in the end of the NASA human spaceflight program. Because what will happen then is, is in this time of national tight belts, sooner or later, it, as the budgets get tighter and tighter, some congressman who doesn't have a NASA center in their district is going to look with covetous eyes on that budget. And people are going to be asking, what have we gotten from NASA in the last 10 years or 15 years or 20 years that's, that's really worth whatever the national priority du jour at that time is. And let's be frank, folks, if we haven't done better in the next 10 years than we've done in the last 10 years, we're going to lose that fight. And NASA's human spaceflight activity will end. And that would be bad for NASA, that would be bad for the nation, and it would be very bad for the commercial spaceflight sector, because you can't be a market for us if you don't exist. Um, and yet, the reason I chose Huntsville to make these remarks is that this hideous, terrible threat to NASA is largely being done in your name if you live and work in Huntsville. It is, it is, to, it is to keep you able to do the things that you're used to doing that your future is being destroyed. So if you think that's a mistake, I encourage you to let your elected representatives know. Uh, because I have the deepest respect for the people I have had the pleasure of working with in NASA. They are good people. Most of them share the dreams that we have. They are not at NASA because they couldn't have cared less if they built rockets or toasters. They're at NASA because they care about this stuff. The overwhelming majority of people I have ever interacted with at NASA are great, good people. If we give them a new task, they will rise to it. It is your elected representatives who seem to lack respect for you because they seem to think that you can only ever do the same thing you've done. I don't buy that. I think you're better than that. 